Dr. Larry brings you another segment of Did You Know? Pain. I don't care if your name is Bruce Wayne, John Wayne, or Wayne Gretzky, or if you're an athlete, superhuman, or an average guy named Newman, or a gal named Sally or Susan. If you've lived long enough, you've experienced some type of spine pain. And as you know, there are countless ads for pills, potions, and lotions, and all geared to treat your back or neck pain. Some are legit, and some are, well, just a little weird. However, when spine pain becomes bad enough to seek a pro, you'll want the one that can find the spot, hit the target, and score the goal. So if you have spine pain from conditions like arthritis, pinched nerves, or bone spurs, then pay close attention to our next guest. He's a practicing physician and board certified in a specialized field. In addition, he's trained in several medical procedures you are familiar with, like steroid injections in the spine and more, which will be the main focus of our show today. So for the sake of simplicity, we'll call this segment Ask the Specialist. Dr. Bruning, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Dr. Larry. Well, I've been excited for this one. You know, I've had some of the other uh, guys from OSMS. We talked anterior hips, bone joint. That's always fun. But uh, when it boils down to it, the spine stuff is uh, is kind of really the, the sweet spot right in my backyard. And, and from what you do, it's the stuff that I don't do. And uh, so I think this is going to be just an excellent show. And just some of the pre-interview stuff that we talked about, um, we're going to bring out in, in the segment as well today, too, that I think you really got an interesting niche that uh, the listening audience here will definitely uh, want to hear. But for the sake of simplicity, as I said first, we got to get through some of these formalities. We got to intro you. So let us have your full name, your license type, and and some board certifications that you have. So my name is Paul Brunding. Um, said with two O's, even though it's a UH, it's a German name. Uh, I have a Wisconsin medical license. I'm board certified in physical medicine and rehabilitation, as well as pain medicine. Excellent. And of course, I spoiled it, but let's give us the, the name and location of where you practice. So I practice down here in Green Bay at OSMS, Orthopedic and Sports Medicine Specialist. Okay. Now, do you work out a, a Marinette in Green Bay or just Green Bay? So some of our other docs go to Marinette, and um, we also have a Fox Valley location as well. We'll be opening up um, our spine pain uh, in the valley this fall. And otherwise, uh, at the moment, nobody's going to Marinette, but there's always room for growth. Sure. You know, and, and I've uh, mentioned this before, too, and, and everybody from uh, the, the local area here, too, knows. Uh, I always say Green Bay, uh, from Iron County to Green Bay in the local listening audience, is closer than Green Bay is to Iron County. So people go to Green Bay like it's in their backyard. So the And I just wasn't sure if you were out of Marinette, too. And I know some folks have already come down to see you. Um, but, uh, and, and I know some go to, like you said, the Marinette location too. So, okay. You heard too, uh, he, uh, he's pretty much primarily in Green Bay at this point in time. Now, this next, uh, question, I, I wanted to, I thought this was interesting, especially the way OSMS is organized, but, um, what, give us a brief history of why you chose or, uh, some idea why you chose to actually practice at OSMS versus some, some other place. Yeah, that's a good question. So I'm born and raised in Minneapolis. The question I get here all the time is, are you a Packer fan? And the answer is yes, I grew up a Packer fan. Uh, but anyway, my wife is from Green Bay. And so we were looking for a job. She actually happens to be a neurologist at uh, Bellin Hospital here in Green Bay. And so we we're looking to come home and there's only a finite quantity of uh, companies and clinics here in town and end up being kind of a friend of a friend who knew one of the physicians here, uh, Dr. Tressler, and kind of reached out via email. And all of a sudden, one thing snowballed into another, and OSMS was at that right spot of, hey, we want to start uh, spine and pain. And uh, so I started our, our first spine program back in November of 21, and it's been uh, slowly growing like an avalanche since then. Nice, nice, and uh, so the, it, that you answered that question as well too. I thought I'd I'd known that you were you, you were basically the the first person to bring spine into the orthopedic clinic there. So nice addition as well too. And um, overall, um, I, I I gotta imagine too for some of the 
uh, the locations you guys have and, and your reputation in Green Bay that uh, once they figured out you were there, um, like you said, an avalanche, not a trickle, which is great. But I got to tell you, I had one of my patients just call you yesterday, and um, thankfully she was able to get in uh, within a couple of weeks. I know sometimes it could be four to six weeks out, but um, the nice part about it, the way you guys are organized there, it's so efficient that once uh, patients are in the system, you guys triage them really well. Um, okay, before we get into kind of the meat of the show and the interview, uh, give us one unique personal talent or hobby or interest you had. It's always fun. Uh, uh, Dr. Flannery, he, he likes to, he's got a smoker that he likes. He to let us know like, one of his favorite foods. And um, I, I think Dr. Sethi says she's got a good butter chicken. So uh, if you've got a special talent, uh, let us know that. It's fun to hear. I think what I would come up with is I taught myself to play the guitar when I was 13. And so the quick math tells me I've been playing for over 20 years and I'm, I'm not as good as I should be after 20 years. So maybe that's the talent I've been doing something for so long, but still not that great at it, but I enjoy playing. Is it, uh, do you play the acoustic, the electric? I, I like to play both. But now that, um, I have little kiddos. I tend to just play the electric in my basement with headphones or no amplifier. Just limit the sound in the home at all times. Uh, the, the decibels are already high enough. <laughs> That's fantastic. And by the way, I'm nodding up and down right now. So we've got six kids, three boys, three girls, five teenagers, one nut. And we started uh, our kids roughly early on uh, just picking up a guitar. I never played, but I just kind of started show, learning how to do one chord at a time or one note at a time and then they take off they took off and ran with it and now my oldest is 20 and they they're it's just live music um they're always picking up a guitar it's, it's just the, like my wife and i said it's just this talent that can always be with you forever no matter what you do so a uh, big smile on my face when i heard you you picked it up and you stick with it like i said it's something that'll never leave you um so do you have a favorite genre of music you like to play or uh or do you kind of cover the mix of everything? Yeah, I think some of my favorite stuff is that more uh, folk style. Um, so even the Led Zeppelin, the James Taylors, anything that's finger picking. I the, the older I've gotten, just the more I appreciate the nuances to all of those. And so, and and they're a lot of times not very easy to play. So nice, nice. So, uh, question then. Uh, I would like you to generally describe. Uh, your two board certifications. Um, you've got a PMR and you've got a pain management specialty, but then also two. Um, so maybe if you can kind of differentiate between those two. And then I got to ask you a question. Um, as you mentioned too, you're, you're a doctor of osteopathic medicine as well too. And I, I suspected that that was going to really tie into what you actually chose to do as a profession. But for, for, you know, the rest of us assume we kind of have just sort of a, a hazy concept um, and help crystallize that for us. What What is the, the, the two board certifications and, and how does that apply for, for what you're doing right now? Extra, extra. Read all about it. Dr. Bruning's board certs that keep him tuned and extra alert. Coming up, stay tuned. You're listening to the Dr. Larry Radio Show. We'll be right back. Dr. Larry. Dr. Larry. We'll be back. Back. In a moment. It's not too late to swap that rickety old wooden dock with a new aluminum flow dock from Jensen Aikens or Three Lakes Docks and Lifts. Quality is at the core of every aspect of our huge selection flow docks. Stop in and design the perfect system from our in-stock inventory and your family could have a safe, reliable flow dock system installed by this time next week. It's not too late. When you choose from Jensen Aikens or Three Lakes Docks and Lifts, in-stock inventory, there's no wait. That's Jensen Aikens of Conover and Three Lakes Docks and Lifts. The inspiration for everything I do is bratwurst. I mean, I like bratwurst. The truth is, if you take my name, Colbus, and you put it in Polish, it means kielbasa, which means sausage. Hi, my name is Pete Colbus, and I'm the meat manager at Family Foods. But more than that, I'm the best-looking person in Iron County. We love using telephone time. It's done a great job for our business. It's really created more business. It's gotten us out there further. I like working with WIKB. I enjoy 
our friendship, the camaraderie, and all the things they bring to the table for us. They really work with me on all different things. Buckskin Bob, everything I've asked for them has really worked out great for us. I enjoy working with them, and I'm looking forward to working with them in the future. This is Julia from Iron River, and you're listening to Dr. Larry Radio. Since the pandemic, I'm so anxious all the time. I can't sleep. I need someone to talk to who's not going to judge me. For emotional support any time of the day or night, talk to a Stay Well counselor. Dial 1-888-535-6136 and press 8. It's free and confidential and one of the many ways to stay mentally healthy. Learn more at michigan.gov slash stay well. Sponsored by the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services and the Michigan Association of Broadcasters. Could there be a better name? Auto Value Parts Stores. They aren't just about air fresheners or fuzzy dice. Auto Value Parts Stores are all about parts. Auto Parts and advice. Pros who know auto parts with tons of tips when you need them the most. You want real value? Don't go to a place with a cute name. Go to Auto Value. Could there be a better name? I didn't think so. Your Auto Value Parts Store. We've got the parts, we've got the smarts. If you're single, a young couple just starting out, or an empty nester, regular size loaves of bread just may be too much of a good thing. Now, thanks to Village Hearth Half Loaves, you can have just the right amount of fresh, delicious bread for toast and your favorite sandwiches. Village Hearth Half Loaves come in five flavorful varieties, including Dakota Style 12 Grain, Honey Wheat, and Premium White. You're sure to find the one that's just right. Village Heart Half Loaves, the perfect size for one or two. Break's Break's over. Over. Time to get cracking once again with Dr. Larry. Welcome back. If you're just tuning in, I'm interviewing Dr. Paul Brunding, board certified in physical medicine and rehabilitation and pain management. We'll be diving into the field and what it can do for spine pain, nerve pain, arthritis, and more. Roll it. What is the, the, the two board certifications, and, and how does that apply for what you're doing right now? Yeah. So my first uh, certification, which is in physical medicine and rehab, uh, somehow uh, or sometimes referred to as physiatry, not psychiatry, but physiatry, as well as PM&R, um, that's a super broad field. So I did a four-year residency after my medical training, and the field of rehab is uh, all encompassing a musculoskeletal conditions, uh, traumatic brain injury, things like stroke, uh, spinal cord injury. And essentially, I, it, the, the whole field had kind of started after World War II and was based out of the uh, Mayo Clinic and had strong Minnesota roots. But basically, all these folks were coming back from the war and had all sorts of uh, different abilities from certain injuries and whatnot. And the whole goal is trying to get there function back to normal, even if it looked differently than what they had before. And I think that in a nutshell sums up the field of physical medicine and rehab very well, where our, our goal as either in hospital or in clinic providers is to try to get our patients back, uh, cooking, cleaning, walking, playing with their kids, going to their job in, in the best, most uh, functional way uh, possible. Okay. And then how then separating that to pain management, um, what in effect, can you generally describe that to us as well too, the pain management board cert? Yeah. So within the um, MDDO uh, uh, residency training, pain management is a fellowship. So you need to have become board certified in either physical medicine and rehab. Um, Anesthesiology is a very uh, popular way to get there. Uh, emergency medicine. One of my friends, Dr. Chris Soley, based out of Minneapolis, just recently completed his. And um, I believe even neurology is, is eligible for that. Uh, but basically, pain medicine takes those musculoskeletal and spine parts of the physical medicine and rehab and kind of puts them on uh, steroids, so to speak. And your training, especially with uh, invasive procedures, becomes way more uh, in depth as well as your breadth of literature and just exposure of patients and different types of uh, pathology. Excellent. And then um, this third component, which is your actual DO, um, way back in the day, there was this local doctor here before my time, Doc Miller. She was a DO. She took care of everybody in the county. Everybody knows now, and I'm saying her name, there's people right now nodding their heads up and down. 
And she was a DO, um, and she did everything from she'd take care of your infections, she'd do your minor surgery, and she'd also do your manipulations as, as if you needed as well, too. So by and through that time, um, people have really had an affinity to, to osteopaths and what they can provide. And also this, the kind of the side specialty that your training has uh, can do as well, too. So um, how has your uh, being a doctor of osteopathic medicine, how is that training tied into uh, what you do now as far as uh, your spine uh, care and pain management? Um, what would you say that training's done and, and how has it helped? Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. It, it's extremely uh, formative. Um, I think I basically view all my patients through more or less an osteopathic lens. And I think uh, one of the big questions that comes up with this is, you know, what's the difference of, um, of training and the schooling? You know, you're a doctor, you know, a physician at the end of those four years of medical school. And some of the big differences are the extra hundreds of hours used um, where we're in labs doing hands-on physical exam, uh, learning different osteopathic techniques and some of the foundations and some of the uh, reasoning and thought behind how and why some things occur. Not necessarily that just, you know, oh, one lab value is a little bit higher, a little bit low. We need to correct that. Like the human body is just a, a beaker and then, you know, make that better and then go on from there for rather viewing it sounds cheesy, but the, the entire person. And, and for that, for me, that means the body, the mind and the spirit, because all of those things, especially in relation to musculoskeletal dysfunction, chronic pain, those type of things. Um, I, I describe it to patients. It's a, it's a yin and a yang where all of those things uh, bleed into one another and you can't easily separate them out. So, um, yeah. holistic, I think if I, if you had to, Put one word to it, it'd be holistic. That, that's how I view my folks. I'm so glad you described it that way um, because the the musculoskeletal system can be a window into uh, other uh, conditions, problems, disease processes, etc. And And because of those extra hundreds of hours of training focused specifically on the manual medicine side of things or the musculoskeletal or the whole person, um, it, it's 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 that that narrow um direct laser focus on that stuff uh kind of adds to the overall patient care and I'll, I'll just cite one quick example um just being a chiropractor obviously uh we handle it's all hands on um but in a, in a way over 22 years of practice what I've done is I've applied because I'm uh, being such a hands on practitioner a whole person approach. So for example, I'd somebody come in with uh, lower left sided rib pain. I examined it. I didn't like the way the rib felt. It was flimsy. It didn't feel right. I put a stethoscope on it, listened to the lower lung, heard some gurgles, didn't like that, sent it out. Primary care ordered up, chest film, said, oh, it's pneumonia. Don't worry about it. We'll get, get an antibiotics course. I refelt the rib again, second exam, and still felt flimsy, didn't like the way it felt. And I said, this is not what pneumonia does to a rib. So we ramped up the testing and we found uh, cancer in the lung, ended up being in the spine, brain, et cetera. Of course, uh, lady I'm living for a few years. But my point is, is, is to tie in what your comment was. I utilized the manual medicine component of it to differential diagnose a problem that really was only manifested in a lower left rib issue um, that was kind of a little bit of an elusive diagnosis up front for primary care. But it was because of that that let me treat and help get the person correctly diagnosed and where they needed to go. And through 22 years of practice, it's been over and over again. So I was really interested when you came on board a couple of years ago. I said, okay, he's a DO, he's, he's PNR, and he's also pain management. This is going to be interesting to see how, how he does with patients. And so far, um, some of the folks I've sent you have done an excellent job, which then um, ties us into what I want to kind of really get into uh, in just a moment. But I want to lay a foundation first. And, and I want to get some background and understanding of some just general things that people suffer with. And one of them, of course, is arthritis. And we're talking about osteoarthritis, not rheumatoid. Um, but just kind of give us, uh, and, and something that we can obviously Google and look up what the definition is. But from your perspective and definition, what is actually arthritis? And we'll, let's, let's say spinal arthritis. What is arthritis? 
Yeah, uh, seemingly a simple question, but so, so complex the more you, you delve into it. Arthritis is just the um, likely standard aging process of a joint that eventually hits a point of no return or, or poor recovery where inflammation leads to chronic pain, leads to cartilage and uh, joint capsule and articular surface changes, which essentially results in limited range of motion and, and increased pain for folks. But um, I, I know you've been doing this long enough, Dr. Larry, as well, to say eh, sometimes it's not that simple. What the x-rays or what an MRI shows does not often uh, line up with what the patient's telling you and what your hands are telling you as well. So it's, it's that whole idea of blending all three of those aspects of the physical exam and the history and all the imaging to figure out what's actually wrong. Now, some folks, and I'm sure you get this question as well too, um, but I'd like you to answer it, is uh, some folks believe genetics for osteoarthritis plays a role. Um, I'd like you to comment on, uh, comment on that. Do you in, in some way, shape, or form believe genetics does, does not, or some combination thereof, but what role or do you think genetics would play a role in just the development of arthritis in somebody's spine over time? Yeah. So for different types of arthritis, there's certainly the inflammatory or even hereditary uh, rheumatoid arthritis, the spondyloarthropathy, such as ankylosing spondylitis. Uh, certainly if you're worried or have some of those, you know, that's a, a rheumatologic problem. We have rheumatology here at OSMS or myself to help delineate that. But there's certainly a genetic component to those um, highly associated with the HLA-B27 gene um, and, and many others. Um, the more common question that I get is for the general osteoarthritis, which is more of that aging process, arthritis of um, any joint, whether large or small. Um, I do think there probably is something to it, but not necessarily, oh, I just got dealt a bad hand and yeah, my joints tend to stink as much as my dad tended to stink as much as my grandpa's, but perhaps it's more of um, the epigenetics of our, our body habitus and the types of work and the types of food and the types of environment that we're in for the 30, 40, 50, 60 years before these things start showing up. And perhaps those um, genetic components could rear their ugly head uh, more or less. But in general, no, I, I would not say that osteoarthritis is necessarily a genetic condition or, or not. Yeah, and, and I totally agree with you on that. And um, so I, I answer the question in, in the version of the way I do it. But essentially, it's like you said, yeah, we, we have a blend of our our skeletal structure from, from our parents. But uh, from what you do for that first you know, decades of life, um, osteoarthritis is basically the the wear, tear, uh, repetitive motion, add in some injury, et cetera. And because of that, the arthritis starts to develop into the joints. And um, and I think you, you mentioned it, but what what is the actual or maybe a few of the mechanisms of arthritis that cause the pain? So it's one thing to have kind of a crusted up joint. Uh, you know, a C7, <laughs> but what, what is the, the mechanism of pain that is, is where we feel it as far as arthritis goes. So before we move on to the next part of the interview, did you catch what he said earlier? I'm going to repeat that. I'm actually going to circle back around. He's a board certified doctor of osteopathic medicine and a physician that views patients quote through that lens. So this is a very important differentiator for how he approaches pain management. So while we're on the topic, I want to grab a definition of what a DO is directly from the source. This is from the American Osteopathic Association. And right there in bold face on the website is what is a DO? And I get this question throughout time as well, too, so I wanted to find it for you right now. Uh, and this is important. Again, assembling a team of practitioners, professionals. Uh, there are other pain management uh, physicians out there, but they're sometimes training uh, concepts and philosophy in a way does make a difference. Uh, and I've seen it play out many times in many different ways as far as uh, execution of good care, etc. So doctors of osteopathic medicine use a unique whole person approach to help prevent illness and injury. Accounting for approximately 11% of all physicians in the United States, doctors of osteopathic medicine or DOs bring a unique 
patient-centered approach to every specialty across the full spectrum of medicine. They are trained to listen and partner with patients to help them get healthy and stay well. DOs, of course, practice practice in all medical specialties, including primary care, pediatrics, OBGYN, emergency medicine, psychiatry, physiatry, pain management, as you just heard, and surgery. Moreover, DOs hold some of the most prominent positions in medicine today, including overseeing in government, uh, NASA, medical team, Olympic athletes, and more. Uh, From their first days of medical school, DOs are trained to look beyond your symptoms to understand how lifestyle and environmental factors impact your well-being. So you heard him paraphrase basically the mission statement coming directly from uh, the website that is the the branch that oversees or the um, kind of like chiropractors and, and medical doctors have their branch, the AMA. Uh, there's chiropractors have their national overseeing or umbrella as well too and what we prescribe to as far as what we're supposed to do. So the practice of medicine, according to the latest science and technology they, uh, DOs do, also consider options to complement pharmaceuticals and surgery. As part of their education, DOs receive special training in musculoskeletal system, your body's interconnected system of nerves, muscles, bones, etc. And by combining this knowledge with the latest advances in medical technology, they offer patients the most comprehensive care available today. So I'll actually be molding and shaping this definition a bit more for you later on in the show in the next segment. So he he's also not just trying to match medications with lab value uh, or just inject medication to your spine without first evaluating you as a whole. That's in his DNA because of who he is and what his training is. So example, I just had a patient as well too. She was at another pain management specialty clinic and I asked her, How is it and how was your experience? And she said, honestly, lousy. She said, I felt like I only talked to them for a minute and that was it. There was no really talk about anything else. Uh, She's had injections before in her lumbar spine. So again, taking the perspective of uh, the whole person approach is unique in and of itself and inherent within his training. So we are getting warmed up with part one of this interview. And again, there's going to be two parts this week and next week. More on that when we get back from the break. Stay tuned. This is the Dr. Larry Radio Show. We'll be right back. We'll be right back, back, back with Dr. Larry. We're, we're back, back with Dr. Larry. Welcome back. Class is in session. Pull out your syllabus. Sharpen your Sharpie. We're going to get the explanation of the mechanism of pain from arthritis with Dr. Brunding. Roll it. What is the, the mechanism of pain that is, is where we feel it as far as arthritis goes? So there are different types of uh, pain, and they're, they're grouped into different buckets. Somatic pain is more of the uh, pain within a, a muscle or a, a cut on your skin or even that kind of sharp uh, osteoarthritis type of pain as opposed to visceral pain, which is more um, – in, indirect, um, even some of our smooth muscle parts of our abdomen. And uh, basically, you have a stomach ache, but you don't exactly know where it hurts. But if you get a paper cut, you know exactly where it hurts on the thumb or whatever. Um, so this is more talking about somatic pain. And my understanding of how and why joint arthritis starts to become more painful is usually due to loss of articular cartilage. So you have two joints together, picture two marshmallows, and there's a nice cushion in between, just a very simple picture of a joint. Over time, usually due to maybe an excessive trauma or load, not necessarily daily use, because I do think there's there's medicine and movement, and you certainly need to move your joints in order to keep them strong and keep cartilage actually firm and regenerating. But there tends to be some sort of mechanism where there's a cartilage damage, which starts a downstream cascade of cartilage loss, potential subchondral or beneath the surface of the bone change. And then within all of those structures are these small little nerve endings for lack of a more uh, specific word to our uh, listeners. And those become sensitized either to local inflammation caused by that ongoing cartilage breakdown and or they can develop chronic pain too. And I, I talked to my folks about this where, um, you're driving 
uh, a wagon through ruts and it gets deeper and deeper and deeper. And after five years, it becomes a lot harder to get those wagon wheels out of that rut. And that's essentially um, what, what happens to nerves if the pain becomes chronic. And so there's different ways to take care of that. But that's how I tend to think about how uh, the mechanism of arthritis works. Yeah, uh, perfect way to say it. Great, great theater of the mind as far as the analogy goes. The ruts get a little deeper and a little tougher to get out of. And and everybody that's got a camp knows uh, there are certain times when you drive on the road, if you create a rut, you're in trouble because that means you got to fix the camp road. But when it comes to spine care, there are ways to be able to help those ruts in the road and those pain generators that come out of the spine. So as far as um, treatment options, and this would be, I guess, a, a way to say it, your sweet spot, uh, your 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 home run, the one that you kind of do, the wash, rinse, repeat. Um, what are some uh, or two uh, treatment options you provide for arthritic neck? And you specifically, of course, there's manipulation. There's you know Tylenol, Ibuprofen. There's a lot of things. We're talking specifically what you do on a day to day basis. Um, what is one treatment option? We'll go through two of them. Uh, what is it, and how is it done as far as just arthritic neck and back pain? When somebody presents to you, you've bet. Patient's been referred in, and you know you've got to now provide your service. What's what's the first one that you do, and how is it done? Uh, treatment number one is not so much a treatment. I'll, I'll kind of cheat a little bit, but um, getting the right diagnosis. And that involves doing the right physical exam, actually sitting down and, and talking with the patients that come in, and really figuring out, but does this sound like an arthritis problem? Or does this sound like something else? Because a lot of people, what I typically see is somebody gets an x-ray by perhaps their family doctor or even at, at an outside facility, and the radiology read comes back, and it sounds pretty bad. I mean, even as a physician, it sounds pretty bad. But as a layperson, you're going through and trying to read this, and there's all sorts of degenerative this and spondylosis that, and you're Googling this going, my neck must be falling apart. And Sometimes that that is as advertised, and, and a lot of times that I, I, I think about those radiology reports as being like a housing inspection. They're very complete. They go through every detail, but not every detail is relevant to what the person's actual pain complaint is. So the first thing I actually try to do is slam that right diagnosis. And then the treatment for that, I, I usually use um, manual or indirect uh, soft tissue techniques either with physical therapy or chiropractor, kind of depending on um, the patient's preference, belief systems, um, where they're coming from within uh, Michigan or Wisconsin. And I I want somewhere to be close and convenient and to be reputable where, where I've had folks have success before. This is, uh, by the way, so this is fantastic because um, I, I'm a big stickler. Folks have been listening to me for all these years now for history and physical exam. And I always say patient presentation trumps those two things versus what radiology, imaging, et cetera, will say. So basically, um, and, and, and doing that first will always yield you down the right path. And um, the one of the analogies that I use, and by the way, folks, um, the doc and I, we didn't do like a pre-show like uh, kind of thing like, um, yeah, this is my analogy and this is your analogy. He had no clue uh, as far as the, the type of analogies that I used about too. I say when a radiology report comes back, their basically job is to go into a forest you use, is, is to then mark everything that they see. If a tree branch is broken, they got to tell you the tree branch. But if there's a blade of grass, they got to tell you the blade of grass. That doesn't mean those are all necessarily bad things maybe just uh it's just what the environment looks like and then i always tell the patients what we have to do now is we have to match you to your clinical presentation and find out what the problem is and use the radiology or imaging as our our tool but not the all-encompassing so so glad you said it that way and uh and i love the um the housing inspecting report so manual medicine first um if manual medicine or conservative therapy doesn't seem to be working, and uh, what would be, uh, as far as uh, like arthritic condition goes, where would be where you've got to ramp it up to the next level, where there's something, um, a treatment option that you offer? Is there like the next step, um, like like a radio frequency ablation, or is there some other um, some other treatment option that you do? Uh, and you could pick one condition, let's say, just off the top of your head, and something that you provide um, if if conservative therapy isn't working. Booyah. That's called a cliffhanger now. 
So you're going to have to wait. Next week, we're going to come up with part two, have part two of the interview. Uh, however, I'm going to go back again just to repeat and from a different angle to help crystallize the difference again uh, with the type of specialty in background and trading uh, that Dr. Bruning has. So in other shows, I've explained the difference between surgeons. Let's say, for example, an orthopedic spine surgeon versus a neurosurgeon. There are similarities, but there are also differences. You as a patient aren't often explained the difference and you think just spine surgeon is spine surgeon and there are, you're there in the office, but I can tell you from experience knowing what separates the two has been crucial in diagnosing problems and treating cases uh, that are going nowhere. So again, uh, understanding the difference between the DO training and MD is crucial, especially for this interview. Both are physicians, both can do equal across the board. However, the education differs from the perspective of the extra 200 hours-ish of training uh, on the manual medicine side of things. I had more stuff I wanted to do. Uh, we ran out of time for this part of the segment. So upcoming announcements, uh, the tip and trick are just around the corner again. Next week, make sure you stay, stay tuned, 12 to 1. We're going to get part two of the interview and really start to crystallize some of the, uh, some of the treatments he does uh, from the uh, spinal side of things and injections and ablations, etc. So upcoming announcements, tip and trick of the week, just around the corner after the break. This is the Dr. Larry Radio Show. We'll be right back. Dr. Larry. Dr. Larry will be back, back in a moment. 